In Los Angeles, California, a girl was kidnapped after being picked up from school. The kidnapper brought her to his apartment, bound her to a chair, and what he would do next to her would become one of the most gruesome crimes ever committed in California history. This is the story of Marion Parker. In Los Angeles, California on December 15, 1927, 12-year-old Marion Parker attended a day of school like she usually would, except this day was a little bit different and not in a good way. While Marion was in her classroom, a man walked into her school and approached Mary Holt, the school registrar. The man told Mary his name, Mr. Cooper, and Mr. Cooper said that he was looking for the Parker girl. Mr. Cooper told Mary that Marion's father, who was also his employer, Perry Parker, had gotten into this really bad car accident and Perry needed his daughter urgently. Mary asked which daughter he was looking for and Mr. Cooper told her he was looking for Perry's youngest daughter. When Mr. Cooper said this, Mary got a bit suspicious because... Perry's daughters were twins. Mary asked Mr. Cooper to clarify what he meant, and this time he was crystal clear with his answer. He was looking for Marion. Mary was still a bit hesitant, but to reassure her, Mr. Cooper gave Mary the phone number for the bank that she worked at, and told her that if she was uncertain, then just ring the number. Mary was now very convinced, as Perry was the chief clerk at the bank after all, and Mr. Mr. Cooper came off as this very sincere person. Marion then sent Naomi Flinton, the school secretary, to go get Marion from her classroom. Once Marion was at the school's office, Mr. Cooper greeted her and began patting her arm, telling her that her dad was hospitalized because of an accident and he would drive her to Perry. Mary believed everything Mr. Cooper said, went into his car, and away he drove. After finishing school, Marjorie, Marion's twin sister, arrived home and Marion was not with her. Geraldine, the mother of the twins, got very worried and rang Marion's friends to see if they knew where she was, but unfortunately, none of them knew where Marion was. Later that day, Marion would be reported missing. On December 16th, 1927, the day after Marion went missing, Perry received this very strange telegram at his home. The telegram said, do positively nothing till you receive special delivery letter. At the bottom of the telegram was Marion's signature. If you're wondering how Perry got out of the hospital so fast, well, he didn't. There was no car accident, and he was never hospitalized. The day Marion went missing was also Perry's 48th birthday, and he decided to take a day off of work to celebrate this with Geraldine. Not long after Perry received that telegram, he received another one. The second telegram said, Marion secure, use good judgment. Interference with my plans, dangerous. At the bottom of the telegram, there was a signature by some guy named George Fox. After receiving this second telegram, Perry rang Marion's school to find out what was going on. They explained to him about that interaction they had with Mr. Cooper, and when Perry heard all the details, he contacted the police. It became very clear to him that Whoever this Mr. Cooper was, and he was definitely not his employee, had kidnapped his daughter. The police gathered detailed descriptions of Marion and the man who kidnapped her. Marion was described as being approximately 4 foot 6 tall and weighing around 100 pounds. She was wearing tan stockings, an English print dress, and brown Oxford shoes. Her straight dark brown hair had been cut in a bob style that fell to her jawline, making her appear almost identical to her twin Marjorie. The kidnapper was described as a white male around 25 to 35 years old, standing around 5 foot 8 tall and weighing approximately 150 pounds. He was wearing a heavy overcoat that was grayish brown, a dark hat, and black shoes. Once the police had all of this information, it was immediately sent to the press. Herman Klein, the chief detective, had instructed 
all officers to participate in the search for Marion as he was very concerned for her safety. As time passed and none of the search efforts yielded any sign of Marion, Perry and Geraldine became increasingly worried about their daughter's whereabouts. On the following day, the Parker family received a ransom letter. The ransom letter said, Use good judgment. You are the loser. Do this. Secure $75, $20 gold certificates, US currency, $1,500 at once. Keep them on your person. Go about your daily business as usual. Leave out police and detectives. Make no public notice. Keep this affair private. Make no search. Fulfilling these terms with the transfer of the currency will secure the return of the girl. Failure to comply with these requests means no one will ever see the girl again, except the angels in heaven. The affair must end one way or the other within three days, 72 hours. You will receive further notice. But the terms remain the same. Fate. If you want aid against me, ask God, not man. Two more letters later arrived, each signed with the strange signatures, Death, the Fox, and Fate which meant the kidnapper had a number of aliases that he went by. One of these letters had a message that was written in Marion's handwriting at the end of it. The message said, Daddy, please do what this man tells you or he'll kill me if you don't. Your loving daughter, Marion Parker. At first, the police told Perry not to give in to the kidnapper's demand for the ransom payment as over 2,000 officers were working tirelessly to locate Marion. But as the kidnapper's threats intensified and Perry received more phone calls and telegrams telling Perry he would kill his daughter if the payment was not made, the police ultimately concluded that paying the ransom was the safest way to secure her release. The kidnapper arranged a meeting with Perry at a specific location, but when he realized that Perry's car was being followed by police cars, he did not show up. Following this failed meeting, the kidnapper continued sending letters to Perry, assuring him that Marion was alive, at least for the time being. The kidnapper also revealed that Marion had seen Perry during that failed ransom exchange and wondered why her father didn't rescue her. The kidnapper now instructed Perry to await a telephone call of his and warned him about getting law enforcement involved in any way. At approximately 7.35pm on December 17th, Perry received the awaited phone call. The kidnapper told him to bring the agreed upon amount of money to the corner of South Manhattan Place and West 5th Street in Los Angeles. By 8pm, Perry had arrived at the designated location with the money. A Chrysler Coupe had gradually pulled up next to Perry's car and the driver, whose face was covered with a bandana, pulled out a gun and asked him if he could see it. Perry, who was now very distressed, said yes and immediately asked if Marion was okay. Perry then noticed Marion slouched in the passenger seat, but the kidnapper reassured him she was just merrily asleep. Perry proceeded to hand over the cash as instructed and then the kidnapper quickly drove up to 432 Manhattan Place pushed Marion onto the streets and fled the scene. Perry immediately ran towards his daughter, hoping that she was just merrily asleep. He was so overwhelmed by emotions, he didn't even bother putting his car into park. Once Perry reached Marion, he picked her up and started cradling her. He then immediately noticed she had a very pale complexion. Perry quickly realized that Marion wasn't sleeping. She had been murdered and the police were quickly contacted. Marion wasn't just murdered, she was mutilated in the most horrific way you could possibly imagine. Towels were wrapped around her corpse to hold everything in place as all four of her limbs were cut off, her internal organs were removed and rags were stuffed inside her. 
a wire was tightly wound across her neck, which cut into her flesh and the wire extended up the back of her head. And then it was tightly wrapped across her forehead so that her head could be kept upright. To create the illusion of her being alive, her eyelids had been stitched open with some black thread. An autopsy was later conducted and it was revealed that Marion had been murdered just hours prior to her corpse being dropped on the streets. If you want to see more videos like this, make sure to leave a like and subscribe. On December 18th, 1927, in Elysian Park, a man was just walking by, minding his own business, when he discovered these packages that were wrapped in some newspaper and tightly secured with twine. He opened the packages and it contained the organs and limbs of Marion Parker. But this was not the only location where Marion's remains were found. In 620 Manhattan Street, a resident discovered a suitcase that was not hers, just laying there on her front lawn. The woman opened the suitcase and inside of it she found papers that were soaked in blood and some black thread which was the same thread that the kidnapper used on Marion's eyelids. A nationwide search for the murderer was launched by the police and over 20,000 volunteers and police officers took part in the search. Disturbing information about the manner in which Marion was murdered found its way to the media and when the residents of Los Angeles found out about this, they became furious but at the same time terrified because they became very concerned for their children's safety. The Parker family and the community banded together, raising a huge reward of $100,000 for anyone who could help identify or apprehend the perpetrator even if the perpetrator was found alive or dead. On December 20th, 1927, law enforcement discovered the abandoned getaway vehicle used by the perpetrator. The car, which had been reported stolen, was traced back to the scene. Fingerprints were found on the car's door and they were successfully recovered for further investigation. As the police continued with their investigation, they discovered that one of the rags that was stuffed inside of Mary had this laundry mark on it and that laundry mark was traced back to an apartment complex. This discovery led them to conduct interviews with several residents of the apartment complex and on December 20th the fingerprints obtained from the abandoned getaway vehicle were matched to William Edward Hickman, one of Perry's former employees. But William was nowhere to be found. During the initial stages of the investigation, Investigation. Law enforcement struggled to uncover any leads regarding William's whereabouts. That was until a worker in a gas station in Oregon reported seeing a man in a green Hudson sedan who he believed was William. Not long after the sighting, in Seattle, Washington, two gold certificates worth $20 were used to buy some winter clothes and this ultimately made the Northern Police very suspicious. On December 22, 1927, five days after Marion's remains were discovered, two police officers from Oregon were having a smoke break. And it was during this smoke break that they noticed a green Hudson sedan passing by. The officer driving the police car immediately drove after the green Hudson sedan while the other officer was sitting beside him. The driver tried fleeing at first, but he eventually gave up and decided to pull over. The driver was none other than William Edward Hickman, and when the officers were arresting him, he did not resist at all and said, well, I guess it's all over. William was taken into custody and without hesitation, he immediately confessed to the kidnapping, but he didn't confess to the murder. He shifted the blame for that on his friend, Andrew Kramer, claiming he was responsible for it. But Andrew had an airtight alibi as he was in prison for other offenses when Marion was murdered, so clearly William was responsible for it. After being arrested, William was subsequently 
extradited to California by the Los Angeles Police Department by train. While en route, he took the opportunity to write a detailed 19-page confession where he now admitted that he murdered Marion. In his confession, William revealed that his motive was to pursue higher education by getting a college degree and he desperately needed the funds for tuition. Now I did mention to you earlier in the video that William had mutilated Marion's body and dropped it out of the car, but if you're wondering how he went about carrying out that mutilation, according to William himself, this is what happened. In his apartment, William first blindfolded Marion and bound her to a chair. Then, he proceeded to strangle her until she lost consciousness. After that, he hung Marion's body over his bathtub so her head was facing down. Then, at the jugular vein, he sliced her throat and drained out all her blood. Which is why she was very pale when Perry picked her body up after it was dropped out of the car. William then cut off all her limbs, removed the organs, and when he was removing the organs, Marion's body had jerked so violently, which suggests that she was possibly still alive at that point. The whole point of William kidnapping Marion was to earn a ransom, and since he now murdered her, he knew he would not receive the money, which is why he reconstructed her and put makeup on her face and sewed her eyelids to make it appear that she was alive when Perry went to make the payment. On January 25th, 1928, William's trial began. In California, the defense, not guilty by reason of insanity, was relatively new. William chose to pursue this defense and his behavior suddenly became very erratic. When he was inside his cell, he started muttering to himself and acted like he couldn't hear anyone when they started speaking to him. To make matters worse, William admitted that he shot and killed a pharmacist during an armed robbery, around a year before killing Marion. This wasn't even William's first time committing a crime. Like most sadistic killers, he had a very troubling childhood and he stole candy from shops when he was just 11 years old. William's attorney decided to try his luck with the insanity defense. To support this defense, William's attorney relied on the testimonies of mental health experts, as well as friends and family members who claimed he was mentally unstable. But of course, the jury did not buy into any of that nonsense, and on February 9th, 1928, nearly two months after Marion was murdered, William was charged with first-degree murder. On October 19th, 1928, Ten months after Marion was murdered, William was executed by hanging. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to leave a like, comment down below and subscribe. Until then, see you next time.